A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. As I watched, thrones were set up, and the Ancient One took his throne. His clothing was snow bright, and the hair on his head as white as wool. His throne was flames of fire, with wheels of burning fire. A surging stream of fire flowed out from where he sat. Thousands upon thousands were ministering to him, and myriads upon myriads attended him. The court was convened, and the books were opened. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the ancient one and was presented before him, the one like a son of man received dominion, glory, and kingship. All peoples, nations, and languages serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. The word of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Peter, Beloved. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of this majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that unique declaration came to him from the majestic glory this is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Moreover, 
We possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. You will do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my beloved son with whom i am well pleased listen to him when the disciples heard this they fell prostrate and were very much afraid but jesus came and touched them saying rise and do not be afraid and when the disciples raised their eyes they saw no one else but jesus alone as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Morning. You know, on a hot, humid, kind of rainy August day, it seems only fitting that we should start off this morning by talking about Christmas, right? That seems very natural. Uh, well, it does if you consider the fact that I talked about a zombie movie during Christmas. I mean, better late than never, right? Um, and so, uh, but it, it strikes me that there's um, I think two kinds of kids on Christmas morning. Right? There's the kids who open their presents and are genuinely surprised at what's actually in there. And then there are the kids who have spent the last few weeks scouring the house, right? Trying to find those hidden places where brothers and sisters and parents have hidden gifts uh, so that they can kind of get a sneak pre preview of the coming attractions, right? Um, and I was always the first kind of kid. I was always genuinely surprised, um, mostly because I just wasn't clever enough to find where people had hidden things. Um, but I actually think that Jesus is the second kid. And I think that because of the feast that we're celebrating and this gospel that we're celebrating, 
Um, right? Today we talk about the Feast of the Transfiguration, right? this moment when Jesus goes up the mountain with, with Peter, James, and John. And what he does is he gives them a, a sneak peek. He gives them a, a preview of the gifts that are to come. Right, because he, they go up the mountain and nothing particularly exciting is happening until all of a sudden Jesus is clothed in this dazzling white and light is emanating from him. And all of a sudden Moses and Elijah are there with him. And, and these are two very important figures. Right? And it's important that it's those particular figures that are here. Right? Moses is this figure of the law. It was through Moses that the law of God first came to the nation of Israel. And so what we have in this person of Moses is kind of this um, encapsulation of everything that the law and the covenant really symbolize. And so that's who, who Moses kind of represents. And then we have this figure of Elijah. Elijah is considered one of the greatest prophets that the Lord has ever sent to the nation of Israel. And so here in these two figures, right, what we have is kind of this encapsulation of the, of the law and the covenant and this encapsulation of all of the line of prophets and conversing with them is the person of Christ, dazzling white, radiant in light, right? There's this, there's this meeting of everything that the Lord has done through the law and the prophets. Everything that the Lord has been doing to save his people is now coming to meet the person of Christ. And they're meeting the person of Christ arrayed in glory and splendor. It's this, this revelation that of his true divinity and what he's really going to do as he fulfills the entire law, as he fulfills the entire line of prophets. Right? In, in the person of Christ, we have this, this meeting, not only of the old things that are coming true, but of a new covenant that's about to be established. Right? It's this sneak peek into the gift that is to come. And that perfect gift is, of course, the cross. Right? That's what they're actually talking about, Moses Elijah and Jesus, they're talking about the gift that is about to be given. Right? This is a sneak preview into what's about to happen, and they're conversing about how the death of Christ in this perfect offering, this perfect gift, is going to culminate everything that Moses and Elijah and everything that the Lord's been doing. It's all going to culminate right there in the blood of Christ. This is how God saves his people. And it's this remarkable thing to the point where Peter, thinking that this sneak preview is actually the gift itself, right? He says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's just stay here. And it's hard to fault him for that. But he doesn't actually understand the gift that is to come. He doesn't actually know what this new thing is about to be. And it's remarkable because as they come down from the mountain, they've been talking about his death and they've been talking about how it is that the blood of Christ is about to save his, the people of God and it's going to bring to fulfillment the entire law and all of the prophets. And as they come down, right, Jesus charges them, don't tell anybody about this until the Son of Man is raised. Right? This is a sneak peek. This is this preview into the gift that is to come. Because it's not just this death of Christ, this perfect gift of salvation that the Lord is going to offer. But three days later on Easter morning, rising from the dead in order to incorporate all of us into this new life, this new covenant ratified in the blood of Christ. And this gift, these two gifts, that of the sacrifice and that of this new life, is something that even though they're talking about it on the mountain, even though they're coming down from the mountain and Jesus is trying to give them this foreshadowing of what's to come. What's amazing to me is that 
at the first gift, the gift of the sacrifice, when Jesus is offering himself to God the Father on behalf of all of humanity. Peter isn't there. Peter isn't there to receive the gift. And he denies three times, I do not know the man. And as the Lord dies and is buried, you can imagine how heartbroken Peter must be. Not only that the fact that, that Jesus is now dead, but that the last thing he did was deny him. You can imagine that moment in the resurrection when Jesus is standing there on the shore and he brings Peter off by himself. Right? Three times the Lord asks him, Peter, do you love me? And Peter three times says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Right? And it's important that it's three times. Because the sacrifice, the gift of the sacrifice and the gift of resurrection are not opposed to each other. In fact, they go together always. And what happens is that as Jesus is inviting us into this new life, he's not going to pretend that the past just didn't happen. He's not going to throw it away or wipe it out or, or, say, or sweep it under the rug, right? What he's going to do is he's going to enter into those moments. He's going to enter into that place of Peter's denial all three times. And all three times he's going to offer Peter this new gift so that he can be incorporated into the gift of the sacrifice and then receive this gift of new life. This is how God works. Brothers and sisters, this is still how God works. The gift of the sacrifice and the gift of new life. Right? This is what's offered to you and to me. We get this, this kind of sneak preview as we celebrate the gift of uh, the feast of the transfiguration. Right? And we're given this celebration in order to remember who it is that Christ actually is and what it is that he's actually done for us and the fact that he lives now to incorporate us into that gift of the sacrifice and to bring us that gift of new life. Right? It's what we do here every Sunday. That's why we come here. Because here at this altar is where we receive both gifts. Both gifts are offered here. Right here as we raise the chalice, as we raise the host, what we're doing is we're re-offering that one perfect gift, that one perfect sacrifice that offers and brings salvation to all of humanity is offered here again. And as it's offered this perfect gift to the Father, what then is able to happen is we're able to incorporate it into our very bodies by communion. Because the sacrifice of Christ, that one perfect gift, also incorporates us into that new life that he offers. The gift of the sacrifice brings about the gift of reconciliation. The gift of the sacrifice brings about that gift of salvation. The gift of the sacrifice brings about that communion in the life of God who lives now. And this transfiguration moment, this glory moment on the mountain, it's just this kind of sneak just a glimpse into the gift that lies before us. And so, brothers and sisters, as we approach this altar, let's not be afraid to enter into both gifts. Right? Let's first enter into that gift of sacrifice. Right? Because what the Lord is doing in that gift of sacrifice is he's giving us a way to start to undo all of the mess that we see in ourselves. Right? We've got these bad habits, these sins, these trials, these tribulations, these disturbances, whatever it is that I've got in my heart. I can offer that to the Father in the gift of the sacrifice here. Right? I can lay this stuff down here at the altar. Just like Peter does when he 
affirms three times, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. We have the same opportunity for redemption here. Because we can bring him all of that stuff. We can offer it up in the gift of the sacrifice. And as we do that, what we then get to receive is the gift of new life, this gift of resurrection. As we come forward to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ into our very bodies. This is what the transfiguration is a preview of. This is what uh, the the gift actually is that, that is just starting to be unwrapped, is starting to be unveiled. And so, brothers and sisters, as we come together this morning, let's not be content to just look at the gift. Let's not be content to just get this glimpse, this little sneak preview, and just kind of leave it at a far kind of distance from ourselves. Just like any kid, as they find these presents scattered about the house, they put them back so that on Christmas morning they can unwrap them and receive them. Let's do that here. Let's not just be content to leave the gift in the closet or wrapped under the tree. Let's embrace it. Let's receive it. Let's enter into it. So that as we allow the gift of the sacrifice to wash over us, that gift of new life can be transformed. It can be received within us.